I'm just so pleased today to broadcast this episode because I have a very special guest with me today who uh, is here in town from Los Angeles. He's actually a native of San Antonio, but he's here visiting us here, visiting us here at Texas State University. He was the artist in residence at the uh, Center for the Southwest Studies, and he was here for the Tomas Rivera Book Reward. And I'm speaking of no other than, than writer, director, playwright, uh, Mr. Severo Perez. Um, and Severo, I just want to just, you know, launch right in and ask you, you know, I was asking you off the mic, you know, do you consider yourself a writer or a director? And so I, I'll just ask you again, how do you, how do you categorize yourself? A writer, director, playwright? Um, well, um, very nice to talk to you, Isaac. Um, uh, I began writing when I was about 13 years old. And, uh, I was, uh, since I'm 74, I bridged several kinds of, uh, of uh, technologies. Uh, when I was a little boy, there was only radio. Television was beginning. I probably went to the first, one of the first uh, uh, introductions of television about, about 1948 when uh, uh, I went to uh, uh, you know, Alamo Stadium, where they had a basketball court and they had television monitors. So I got to see television in San Antonio for the first time. But there was radio that, at that time, and I, uh, there was radio programming very similar to what now is television programming. There'd be, you know, dramatic programs. <clears throat> and there was some, you know, I, that I, I listened to regularly, uh, The Lone Ranger, Sky King, uh, you know, Sergeant Prescott of the Prescott of the U, of the Yukon, um, and uh, uh, so when I was 13, I was writing radio plays. Uh, I had no idea what what I was going to do with them. It was just something that I did, and and took them to school, and the teacher would look at them and hand them back, and that was about it. Uh, they had no idea how they could help me, and uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Uh, but I kind of continued to pursue it as a, as kind of something in the back of my mind that I really wanted to write. Um, why did I do that? Well, I had a certain feeling about writing that on that page, I had complete control over the world that I created. And uh, in my own life, I had very little control over the world around me. So it was a, a, a small, amount of empowerment, sort of, of, uh, of creative, you know, creatively involved in something. Um, <clears throat> as I got into high school, I got nice compliments from teachers uh, telling me I, did, I, I wrote nice essays. Uh, when I got to college, uh, my English teacher told me that uh, one, of my art, one of my essays uh, was good enough to be in, in Reader's Digest. Uh, these were all sort of compliments, and uh, um, again, I still had no idea what I was going to do because uh, there was no nothing around me that uh, that guided me. I, I at that time I had gone to San Antonio College for two years, and uh, I really wanted to go to UT, but uh, my grades had slipped at the last minute when I was at San Antonio College, so I went. I was on academic probation. So the only, uh, the, I actually applied to Tex Southwest Texas State, which is now Texas State University. I got in here and uh, uh, it was quite liberating because uh, I, I immediately found a, uh, a teacher. Her name was Mamie Smith, who taught English here and had a short story workshop, and which I attended and started writing short stories, you know, directed for her as the audience. And she told me that, uh, that I should not stop. I should continue writing. Uh, from there, I went to UT, where I took, uh, you know, I, I spent a year here, got my grades up, went to UT, where uh, I took uh, uh, short story workshops and, um, and playwriting workshops, or classes. Uh, and uh, I, I really believed that I belonged there amongst the other students who were many were 
you know, Anglo. I was the only Latino in class. Uh, I felt I was better than a better writer than any of them. And uh, again, but still, I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. Uh, I went into uh, Right after I graduated, I went into the Navy and served two years. And when I got out, I immediately was hired by the Texas Employment Commission to be a employment <laughs> uh, interviewer, uh, which gave me some money that I really hadn't had before in my life. Uh, and uh, with that, I bought a, a, a 16 millimeter movie camera. And my brother and I, uh, and a couple of other friends started making films on Saturday mornings. Uh, we were, we were, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't leave writing. It just that uh, I became truly in love with filmmaking, and I realized, uh, partly through a series of accidents, that I have no depth perception. One of my eyes is 2030, and one of the other eye is 2400. Hmm. So, uh, you know, one eye is just along for the ride. It's really not. It's not really doing the looking. Hmm. So I'm left-eyed and right-handed, which has always been a problem in terms of sports. Oh, okay. Because you know where, <laughs> my you know my aim is like two or three inches off. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, two to three inches, right? So. Uh, um, well, let me ask. So, you know, before I, I just say, I should say that, you know, Severo is, is a director of, you know, well over 100 films. Um, um, I don't know, um, many, many plays. Uh, I don't know how many novels you've written. <laughs> Only or, three plays and one novel so far. OK, three plays and one novel. Um, and, you know, I don't know who, what maybe what you're best known for, if it's uh, Inose Lo Trago, um, La Tierra, the, the, the Earth Did Not Devour Him, you know, the Tomas Rivera uh, adaptation, or if it's Soldier Boy from your work with El Teatro Campesino y Luis Valdez. And actually, on that note, I, I want to just ask you, you know, um, what was what was growing up in San Antonio in the 40s and the 50s? What was that like? And, and what what did your parents do for work? And were they educated? And um, what was your what was your family life like in those days? Well, I had a very uh, I had a really great childhood. I mean, I had wonderful parents. Um, my father was a World War II veteran. He he was part of the 36th Division, which uh, uh, was one of the one of the one of the most uh, uh, battle-tested groups in the Second World War. Uh, he saw action from Salerno all the way to Berlin. Uh, he, uh, he came back. Uh, the thing is that my father was a very sensitive man, you know, a very intelligent, sensitive man. He only went to the seventh grade because my grandfather was a vegetable peddler. And as far as my grandfather was concerned, he, you know, if you can read and write and add and subtract, that's it. That's all you need to know in life. Mm. Um, that's all he needed to know. So as far as he concerned, that's all anybody needed to know. Uh, my mother were, was from a family of people who were carrancistas. They had left uh, Mexico during uh, sort of in, in 1921 when Carranza had been assassinated and the family had to leave the country. Um, my grandfather on that side of the family was uh, was uh, a blacksmith, a gunsmith, a silversmith. Uh, uh, he made knives and, and things like that. He, so uh, certainly somebody that the the enemy faction did not want, you know, around, mm. because of course the fact that he could repair guns and and like that. So um, so. In, in a certain sense, uh, I have relatives on my mother's side that never married because they would have had to marry below their station. Mm. And my mother saw this really handsome man and, and decided to take a risk on him. And they had a fantastic marriage that lasted um, until they both passed away. I mean, it was, uh, uh, they loved each other extremely. Did you uh, have any siblings? I, had the, I have a brother, I have two brothers and a sister. But I'm the eldest. Uh, my mother did wonderful things for us. Uh, the most marvelous thing she did for me was that 
she would read to us every night a chapter from a book. Mm. So, you know, it was, you know, I fell in love with Mark Twain, so I went to the library and picked up Huckleberry Finn, uh, Tom Sawyer, Tom Sawyer Detectives, Tom Sawyer Abroad, uh, you know, and, and many other books. But uh, she would read those books to us one chapter a night. And uh, it was just magical. I could still hear her voice, you know, lint filling the air as she created these stories. And to this day, I still have a vision of, of Huckleberry Finn that, uh, that is seared in me. And, 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 and you know, I, uh, the moral crises of the book and those kinds of things are, are, have, are, have really impacted me. Um, it, uh, it created a, a creative mind. Which, uh, which I felt was that well, radio did as well. Um, um, but uh, my father was a Kelly worked at Kelly Field until he retired. Uh, he only, as I said, he only went to the seventh grade. But he, he wanted me to be a lawyer, and it turned out that, uh, uh, well, I really I wanted to be a writer more than a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I, I pursued that and. Uh, very interestingly, I, you know, not having any mentorship or anything like that, I, I decided that a writer needed to don't know about everything. Mm. So history is about everything. So I decided to major in history. Uh, uh, I did have a minor in English, but uh, uh, the uh, kind of I'm actually I'm glad I, I made that choice when I was 17 because uh, I've used my research skills that I learned in college you know, forever, ever since. Uh, and also, uh, you know, I became very interested in contemporary politics and contemporary history and like that, which I think just informs all of my work. Um, So you graduated with a, a bachelor's degree from UT Austin. Yes. In, in American literature and American history and, uh, and and a minor in English, which was really creative writing. Mm -hmm. And at that, and at that, was it after you graduated college that you you bought the camera and you and your brother y'all started yes, making? Yes, that was when after I got out of the military. After the military, and like, so what were those early films like? What what would what would y'all be actually making? Well, it was just little stories that we would make up. We. Uh, um, um, what was that? The, the my first film was about 14 minutes long. Um, it was kind of a day in the life of a stoner. Um, very exper experiential. Um, well, actually, I actually finished it, and I and I put sound on film. Uh, uh, so. I, I sent it to a fellow in Dallas who uh, was putting together something called the New American Cinema, uh, and uh, and it toured the state as the Texas Underground. Um, I, um, <laughs> I you know I submitted it to the New York Film the New York Filmmakers Cooperative, and they accepted it. Hmm. <laughs> and, you, why, well, I have to ask you, like, you kind of chuckle. What, what, why is that funny to you? Just because it was... Because, like, I had no clue of what I was doing. And some of these guys, you know, to be a filmmaker, most of these guys came from very rich families. Uh -huh. And I was doing this on, on a salary of, like, of about $320 a month. Mm. Mm. So it, it wasn't the, I wasn't rich in any possible way. Uh, but, you know, a roll of 16-millimeter film was like 8 bucks or 7 bucks. so... Uh, and processing was like five dollars, so it's something I could afford. Mm. Uh, I would edit the original film, and uh, and we made a bunch of little films like that. Most of them were just exper experiential. I mean, just movement, just movement, uh, going down the highway and shooting things, you know, on the road, so that you had things weaving in and out, or watching how how telephone lines will blend and move and blend and move. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things were just fascinating to me. So uh, I did a lot of that. Um, at a certain point, I was I got involved with uh, a documentary. I, I did uh, documentaries in town, here in town. I'm hired by a production company. 
I, I did uh, television commercials um, with absolutely no training, no idea what I was doing, except that I had a pretty good idea how to create, you know, images in focus and, you know, exposed correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I did uh, Village Casuals, was, I did four commercials for them. I did commercials for uh, Lay's Potato Chips. I did uh, a commercial for Whataburger. In, this was all here in Texas. All here in San Antonio, in yes. San Antonio. And then uh, we did a documentary, I mean, by we, the company that I was involved with, uh, did a company, a film about uh, about a freeway going through um, Almost Park in San Antonio. And Almost Park was one of my favorite places in San Antonio. It was really an exquisite little park. Had a stream going through it, a bunch of oak trees and pecan trees. It was kind of river bottom property. and. Um, uh, nobody wanted to build there because it was also kind of like a floodplain, so it was really beautiful. And uh, this park, this freeway, was going to go right through the middle of it. Mm. So, um, you know, I was the cinematographer, and that's being kind of fancy because I'm really I'm not skilled enough to call myself a cinematographer. I was a cameraman um, on that show, and uh, the show was then shown on primetime television in San Antonio and the mayor, uh, Mayor McAllister, came on right after and rebutted the film. Really? Yes. And said, you know, when this freeway is finished, it's going to be just as beautiful as it was, you know, bef you know before there was a freeway there. Uh -huh. Well, it's a lie. I visited the place and it's now just, you know, you know, an ugly place. They, mm -hmm. put the, they put the freeway right where the creek was, right where the trees were. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, what's left is a ball diamond and other places like that. They're kind of in the dusty area where the floodplain is. Mm. Um, so, uh, but after that, no, no ad agency would hire me. So mm. I had to figure out what I was going to do with myself. And I was hired by, uh, by some people to go to Los Angeles to, uh, to production manage or hire a crew basically for a commercial for, um, for uh, Lone Star Brewery. So at, at this point, are you, even though you're doing a lot of creative and kind of ex uh, experimental things on your own and, you know, with your friends and your brother, you're, you're being paid to do kind of professional, commercial, commercial, commercial stuff and actually yeah. hired to, they hired you to move from San Antonio to Los Angeles to work on this project? Well, they, they, well, they, 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 they hired me to go to Los Angeles and hire a crew okay. to bring back. To bring back, okay. Um, Yes, not only was I, uh, the thing was, not, not only was I high, being hired to do these commercials, I was actually also the salesman. Oh, really? Yes, I was the one going and pitching the projects to to the ad agencies that we could do these things. And and since I had a fairly good idea of how to do them, I mean, it was really low, low budget uh, yeah. kind of things. But they looked really pretty and uh, people wanted more. Uh, but after that documentary for the Sierra Club, uh, as I said, nobody would hire me uh, locally to do work. Mm -hmm. So when I had a chance to go to Los Angeles to pull a, get a crew together, which I did, and we shot the, it was a one-hour television special for Lone Star Brewery, starring people like Feli Jose Feliciano, Vicky Carr, um, uh, 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 what the, Trini Lopez, mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, uh, I realized if I really wanted to be a filmmaker, I needed to be in L.A. and not in San Antonio. So you, 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 have, the f you have the film bug. You're, you're still a writer. You have this rich childhood of your mother's influence and the radio and um, support, a supporting family. And now you got the, the, the film bug and you want to... Right, at this point, when you're in L.A. and you're saying, okay, I want to be a filmmaker, are you thinking... You want to make feature-length films, documentaries, or what did you want to do? What did well, you feel passionate about? Well, uh, I recognized right away that I could not compete with the, the with the uh, with with the talent that was out in L.A. I mean, there were cinematographers immediately that I met. I mean, the guy that I worked with, that I hired to take to Los An to San Antonio, and worked on you know some major. They were low-budget films, but they were very successful. I mean, 
the guy named was uh, John Morrill. He's still an acquaintance after all these years. Uh, that was 1970, 1971. So we're still acquainted after all these years. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he became a teacher at USC uh, in cinematography. Um, I mean, a, a really knowledgeable guy about cinematography. I mean, I realized that I was not in his league. I said I was a cameraman. I could, you know, push the button. I could get the focus. I could get the correct exposure. What separates the difference? Is it knowledge of lighting and different... Lighting, the chemistry of, of photography, uh, the, the physics of, op, of light, mm. uh, and all of those kinds of okay. things that have just go way beyond anything I understood about it. Um, there were, I met an editor who had an Academy Award nomination. So, like, I had, you know, I had no... You know, I, I knew how to... I knew how to glue two pieces of film together, but but uh, I was not in his league. Mm. Um, so, uh, but there was a job for somebody who knew a little bit about everything, mm. and that was a production manager. And uh, I began as a production assistant, and immediately I was hired as a production manager. I knew all about the rental houses. I knew all about the equipment. I knew about you know, uh, you know. I'm always, at that time, I was really uh, pushing myself to be as excellent as I could at what I was doing, and uh, you know, bringing shows in on budget, knowing schedules, knowing budgeting, uh, those kinds of things, which uh, uh, which actually separated me from the film students because mm -hmm. somehow they didn't learn about those kinds of things. They were kind of more heady, thinking mm -hmm. about art and. and mm -hmm and films while I was involved in strictly about what does it cost to make a movie. Mm -hmm. um, at, at a certain point, I worked uh, on the feature film Executive Action as a location manager. Um, and again, I had no idea what I was doing. I was brand new to Los Angeles, and I'm trying to find locations that look like Dealey Plaza and you know where Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'd never been to Dallas. Mm. <laughs> uh, but uh, I got away with it. Um, I found locations, uh, uh, and I made some very, you know, some longtime friends. The producer of that film was a man named Dan Bessie. He and I went to business together. After that, he needed somebody who who was hard ass in terms of of uh, budget and schedules, and <laughs> keeping to, you know meeting deadlines because he was a little bit looser. Were you at, when you're making when you're working on these projects? Um, are you actually managing a team of people? So, like when you say you know hard and keeping online, is it just keeping yourself online, or you got to like keep other people on? Well, basically, most of those people were professionals, so they knew what to do. But you you know your job is to uh, schedule the the, the shoot, uh, plan out how you're going to do the day, um, figure out uh, you know how much film you're going to need, uh, you know how much. Uh, recording tape you're going to need, make sure that uh, everybody is supported, you know, order lunches and know when, you know, what, know when to take a break. Uh, amongst the things that I did at that time, it was really aggressive. I mean, I, I read the entire SAG contract, so I knew, you know, the rules mm. of how you deal with actors and how, how many hours you can work them. How many hours you have to, they have to be off before you, they can come back the next day? What is meal penalties? What is golden time? What is, you know, the, those kinds of things that uh, that you need to know as a producer. Mm. Uh, and I learned the same thing about you know the rules of the for the unions, which were less which were less you know demanding that as SAG SAG was extremely demanding in terms of what they require. Um, so in, in, this, in the process, I'm really becoming more of a producer rather than just a production manager. Mm. Um, I actually bought the company a few years, a couple of years later that I was working for, and that's when we started producing medical films and scientific films, museum exhibits, uh, uh, anything that would come in the door, we would we would do. Mm. So it, at this point, you are a, a self-sufficient. You are a professional. Director, producer. Well, at this point, a you're, professional producer. And you're you're being you're able to pay your bills and eat and everything. Exactly, and uh, actually make the rent, uh, have a payroll, and uh, like that. Uh, 
Um, and then I started, uh, you know, expanding with the profits that the business would make. I would resync them into a, into a film that I completely controlled myself. So I started doing educational films. And you asked me, what was the thing that I wanted to do? Well, I had, at that time, educational films were kind of a, a, a calling card for feature films. You know, all kinds of really fine filmmakers were doing short little films, beautifully done, um, uh, to show to the studios, that, well, this is what I can do. Mm -hmm. So I, I told myself, boy, if I can be that, if I can be, have one of those films within one, you know, have, be in one of those catalogs, I will have made it. Mm. Well, within a year, I was in one of those catalogs, and I realized, well, you still haven't made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you still, you know, you're just at the beginning. Mm. So what, at, well, at that point, what did the next bar become that you thought, well, that's, then I'll kind of really be what I'm trying to be? Well, I, I felt that what I really needed was some experience with actors mm. and to learn how to speak the language of actors. Mm. Um, uh, uh, I found that most film students had no clue for how to uh, how to speak to an actor, mm. and well, there were acting classes all over Hollywood. I mean, with some really really brilliant people. Mm. Uh, so I started taking acting classes, mm. not to act, but to know how to speak to actors, know how to help them get to what where they need to be as as uh, as an actor, mm. and. Uh, so that was enormously helpful. I, I then uh, I wrote a play that was uh, seen by Carmen Zapata, who had her own uh, her own uh, theater company in L.A., and she wanted me to work for her, so I did. I translated a, a play from Spanish called Uprooted, Los Desarraigados in Spanish, a rather famous play in, Sp in Mexico. Um, Jose Arenas, I believe, is the, is the author of the play. So I did the English adaptation of that play. It was really successful. It uh, was seen by people at the Mark Taper, which was one of the big theater companies in L.A. It was uh, it toured the state, um, you know, as as a play a for Carmen Zapata's company. I then wrote a second play, which she wanted me to write, which was a disaster. Oh really? Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> It was terrible. Why, because why was it terrible? What made well, it terrible? because I had no clue about uh, about about uh, you know the play, and and also because it was uh, suddenly I had a co-writer, and uh, which I had no intention of having, uh, and uh, so my lines were being rewritten, and and uh, uh, any jokes that I had told were, had been struck, and. Things that they thought was funny would put in the, you know, my name was on it, but man, I didn't want to. I was so ashamed of it that I, I didn't want to be seen in the theater. Mm. Um, but that's just one of the lessons you learn that uh, that unless you are completely in control, you're not in control. Well, can I ask? So you, you know, you you have this rigor about you, this kind of volition, this way of like getting things done. Would you attribute this? Is this? just part of your kind of your natural temperament or is it from being the eldest child and you know waiting for your dad to come home and the responsibilities or is it just you or where does it come from well people who might have known me as a child would, would wonder where the hell did it come from uh. because uh in fact i was not uh that kind of person mm. i mean i was not rigorous in terms of school i just sort of went along uh school was easy for me I mean, all I had to do was read something once, and I would remember it. Mm. Uh, so when when I took tests, you know, I would make C's, mainly because I never refreshed. Mm. I had learned the thing once, and it was there, mm -hmm. and I didn't care. Nobody nobody pushed me to be more more demanding of myself. Mm. Uh, but when it came to uh, money, when it came to survival, mm. I realized that uh, you know. You have to really pay attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, something can slip right by you, and suddenly you're, you've lost two or three thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and uh, that was just something I couldn't afford to do. Mm. So, uh, just the discipline of it—that uh, that just the camera itself demands you to pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to pay attention to the focus. You have to pay attention to the exposure. You have to expense, pay attention to the composition, mm -hmm. and those things, you know. 
are demanding enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I, and I, and, and in all my years, I have never not delivered to a client. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that was my mantra: was that I wanted to to continue making projects. I wanted to uh, uh, not only just please the client, make the client feel proud of the work that he commissioned me to do. Mm-hmm. And that he could, have, he could have to, that they had a sense of ownership of it too. Mm-hmm. And so they became collaborators. And most of my, for many years, I, the same clients kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back. Mm-hmm. That's what basically kept me going. Mm-hmm. If I didn't have, if I hadn't had that, I would have been really struggling. Mm-hmm. 